Okay, here's the rundown. The dragons have taken over Skyrim. They've burned down all the towns, decimated most of the population, and are patrolling the skies with armies of undead under their command. We are one of the only survivors. Now, we have to save the world, surviving in the lawless wilds and somehow growing strong enough to dethrone the world eater. Our adventure then begins with us awaking in a mountain cabin alone except for a Khajiit stranger. He's there to give us a brief description of the dragon's attack and warn us about a masked figure in Falkreath who's commanding the local undead force. Our first objective is to seek answers in Falkreath, but before we do that, we want to gather some resources. We're at Angie's camp in the Southern Mountains, a minor location from the base game where you can practice archery. Angie appears to be rather dead at the moment, so we eagerly loot her property. Loot in containers is somewhat random, so it can be different each playthrough, making this a cool, roguelike way to start a run. We find reinforced iron armor and an iron shield, which is heavy, but would give us some decent protection. We also gather foodstuffs because we're playing on survival mode. We'll need to eat, sleep, and stay warm, or else our stats will suffer. So we leave no provisions behind. To get to Falkreath, we have to head down the mountain. The air is pretty cold, and we tire quickly, but we soon come across a cave called Ancestor Glade. For this playthrough, I'm using the Experience mod to overhaul character progression so that we level up by defeating enemies and discovering locations, rather than by spamming skills. Finding Ancestor Glade gives us enough XP to hit a level up, but since we're on survival mode, we can't use it until we've taken a rest. Instead, we loot the remnants of a nearby campsite and find a dead wolf. This gives us an opportunity to start honing our hunter skills and try field dressing the body. These features are added by the Hunterborn mod, which makes hunting and harvesting resources from animals more immersive. We skin the pelt, but aren't very good at this yet, so the pelt comes back ruined, and in the time this has taken, we've been getting progressively colder. So we head into the the cave for shelter. It's warmer inside Ancestor's Glade, but it sounds like we're not alone. We decide to play it safe and just wait quietly by the entrance while we warm up, then head back out to finish harvesting from the wolf. It's slow work, but we manage to procure an eye, tooth, and claws that we can use in alchemy and butcher a bit of wolf meat. Now we're freezing again, so it's back into the cave. By the time we're no longer shivering, it's already evening, so we opt to head back up to the campsite where we woke up, rather than continue down the mountain to day. Better to play it safe when you know swarms of undead are on the loose. We cook up the wolf meat, gather some branches, which is a feature added by the campfire mod, then say our prayers to Akatosh before going to sleep for the night. This lets us use the level up we gained earlier. I put it towards higher health and more archery damage, since bows are bound to be useful throughout our playthrough. Useful for both hunting and combat. It's still before dawn as we begin our descent down the mountain into Falkreath. We soon come across a fox who wandered up the Wrong trail and decide to do some more ingredient harvesting. We skin the pelt poorly and collect several fox teeth, then carve off a bit of meat. Meat is the best way to stave off hunger right now, but we'll need to make a campfire later to cook it. Then we continue down into Falkreath Forest where the air is warm and the grass is green. These woods are sure to be teeming with game and useful plants. However, we soon spot a skeleton, the first of the undead swarms we'll soon be contending with. We take it out with one quick arrow, then pick some mushrooms for alchemical use. Falkreath proves to be a dangerous place, as we soon come across more skeletons, including a pair of archers. These guys are seriously threatening. Even after our HP upgrade, we die in three hits, and our health doesn't automatically regenerate because of survival mode. We carefully use a tree for cover as we shatter the last archer's bones with a well-placed arrow, but our longbow breaks in the process. Welcome to the mod loot and degradation, which causes equipment to gradually degrade in quality and break when overused. This mod means we have to mind our equipment's durability and treat every piece of gear as a resource with limited life expectancy. Fortunately, we have backup bows and can take more arrows from the skeleton's remains. We pick some pretty flowers and then discover what remains of Pine Watch, a small house that served as the cover of a bandit hideout in base Skyrim. Here we find a woodcutter's axe, which lets us chop dead wood to use for building campfires, as well as a bunch of leeks and potatoes ready for harvesting. But now we're running into a problem. Survival mode drastically reduces our carrying capacity, and in a playthrough where we want to carry around food, camping supplies, and equipment backups in case our gear breaks, we're going to often be struggling with this limitation. We ditch our shield and some books because staying alive is a much more pressing matter right now than catching up on our summer reading list. 
Now what we need is to establish a base of operations, some place where we have access to an alchemy table and safe sleeping quarters. Nowhere outside is safe from the patrolling undead armies, so I decide to target Embershard Mine, a cave near Riverwood that was occupied by bandits in the base game, but should now be abandoned. We get attacked by wolves along the way, but don't want to spare the time to skin them and butcher the bodies. When we reach the river, we find the Guardian Stones. I'm using a mod called Andromeda that expands the effects Standing Stones grant you, and here I choose the Warrior Stone. This blessing helps us learn the skills of a warrior more quickly, but also increases the damage we deal with long-range bow attacks. We'll be relying on our bows to take out Draugr from afar, so this should be a useful bonus. Speaking of which, we soon encounter a mighty restless Draugr along the road, a far more threatening opponent than the skeletons we've been fighting so far. He seems to be on his own and retreats from us for some reason, maybe to seek backup from others. We let him go and sneak away into the hills, which appears to have been a good move, since shortly after it seems there are multiple Draugr searching for us. We make it safely to Ember Shard Mine, and presumably the Draugr don't know we're here. We loot some more mushrooms, foodstuffs, and gold, though I don't know what we'll ever be able to spend it on and find a lovely treasure chest containing a Staff of Sparks. It may not seem like much, but this staff will save our life in the near future, so don't forget about it. We store some of the gear we don't need in the chest, but that's when I notice there's suddenly a skeleton in the room behind us. It doesn't fight us, instead it turns and runs away. I get scared that he's going to report us to a dragon or bring reinforcements to raid the cave. Our pockets are still too stuffed with loot for us to run, so I have to pause again and drop more gear before I can chase after it. But we're hungry too, which reduces our max stamina and the skeleton spy gets away. Now I'm worried that Ember Shard won't be safe for us much longer, but we're also fatigued and need to sleep, so we decide to take the risk and set up a campfire, then curl up in one of the bedrolls left by the previous occupants for a quick two-hour nap. This won't cure our fatigue, but we've killed enough undead to level up. We upgrade health again and empower our destruction magic, since flames is proving to be a quick go-to damage source that doesn't risk breaking our bows. The Draugr haven't raided our hideout yet, but we can't assume we'll be safe here, so carefully we stealth outside. Under the cover of night, we flee back south into Falkreath. We're going to need a new base of operations, preferably with an alchemy table, so we can finally do something with all these mushrooms we've been gathering. Thankfully, the night is quiet, and we don't cross paths with any more undead. We find some arrows and a health potion at the overgrown tower, and collect more botanical ingredients. Then, just as dawn is peering over the horizon, we come to the city of Falkreath, which we inspect from a distance. It's hard to tell how many undead there are within, but there certainly don't seem to be any survivors. We're not well enough equipped to go storming the town just yet, so we continue on down the road in search of shelter. What we come to next is technically a shelter but probably won't be our base. Haldir's Cairn. This cave is the site of some gruesome ritual and is infested with Draugr, but the bodies of the human sacrifices do have some usable gear on them. This is also a place where we can sleep, and we've been running on fumes all night, so we take a solid seven hour rest. We're awoken by the unpleasant reminder that, hey, the world is ending in 98 days. That's when Alduin will descend upon us if we haven't already killed him, so best get a move on. We decide to explore the dungeon to see what else we can find, and the undead here have been unaffected by the apocalypse outside. It's actually kind of a relief to be tackling a dungeon that's the same as it is in the base game. We get a bunch more combat experience towards leveling up, find some gold that we'll probably never be able to spend, and finally approach the boss chamber. I think I've only fought this boss once or twice before, so I didn't have a very clear recollection of him. If I had, I might not have risked challenging him, but in that moment, I was feeling a bit reckless. Haldir is a pretty standard Draugr boss with some frost magic, but at one point during the fight, he splits himself into three. His frost magic is the main threat here, but remember that staff of sparks we got our hands on at Ember Shard. Lightning damage lowers enemy magicka, so it's super useful here to keep Haldir from being able to cast his ice spells. We use up the entire remaining charge on the staff during this fight and heal ourselves with our own magicka while Haldir attempts to get into melee with us. When the staff runs out of charge, we finally take Haldir down with mace and flame in a fight that very nearly resulted in our death at multiple times. We got lucky making it out of that one. But oh, how the reward is worth it. Haldir was carrying a superior 
superior quality Enchanted Sword. The sword being superior means it won't break in combat until it's degraded all the way back to base form, and the enchantment deals bonus frost damage on hit. This is by far the best weapon we've acquired so far, a prize worth the risk. The treasure chest is much less exciting, but it does hold a stone that completely restores our magicka on use. Down in the entry chamber, we can rest again and take another level up, this time putting our perk point into one-handed damage, since we now have a pretty sweet sword. We depart Haldir's Cairn, again under the cover of night, to continue searching for a base. It begins pouring rain and we're confronted by a pair of skeletons, but we're well equipped to deal with them now. The real fight comes when we stumble across Cracked Tusk Keep, a fort guarded by a band of orc hunters who've survived the apocalypse. There are a few survivors like this in Skyrim, mainly those who live in remote areas. Sometimes they're friendly, but often they're not. These hunters won't tolerate our trespassing on their turf. With fire magic and our mace, we cut them down and storm their fort. Within are two more who we burn to death, and then the keep is ours. We've hit the jackpot. Crack Tusk Keep is a fantastic base, equipped with sacks of food, barrels of alchemy ingredients, an exterior armory, and, finally, an alchemy table. When I found this, I jumped for joy. This is one of the features about this mod list that I love the most. Things that you never cared about in base Skyrim, like a random bandit camp having an alchemy table, are now absolute game changers. We're going to spend some serious time here making potions and improving our gear so that when we leave, we're ready to properly hunt Draugr and take back Falkreath from the undead. I'll save you the full rundown of all the crafting we perform at Cracked Tusk Keep, but here are the highlights. Using the animal pelts the orc hunters had gathered, we craft a large backpack, which increases our carrying capacity by 50 points. We upgrade all of our armor to the fine tier, which raises its protection and means we won't have to worry about it breaking for a bit, until it degrades back to base tier. At the alchemy table, we do what any good Skyrim alchemist does, and start rapidly ingesting stuff we picked up off the ground or from dead animals to figure out its properties. Then, we experiment at random, to see what sorts of brews we can concoct. Because I'm using the complete alchemy and cooking overhaul mod, there are a lot of new ingredients and new effects that we can obtain through alchemy. At the end of our stay at the keep, we now have an upgraded bow, over 100 arrows, our superior frost sword, a fully upgraded armor set, a necklace of hunger that drains health from nearby enemies, an assortment of potions and poisons and pounds of prepared meats and produce. We didn't find a cooking station in the keep, so I wasn't able to do any advanced cooking but we should have plenty to eat for the next few days at least. Now it's time to face the world again with all our upgraded equipment and finally go Draugr hunting. We're heading straight for Falkreath now and easily dispatch a few skeletons who we find on the way. Approaching the western gate of Falkreath, we hear a large group of undead inside. We cautiously get a better vantage point and spot the central threat lurking within, a dragon priest, the masked figure that we initially heard about who's at the helm of this Draugr swarm. I decide to head back a bit down the road and lure the undead out of the city so I can pick them off as they approach. We take down a couple Draugr this way with well-placed arrows, but are then confronted by the Dragon Priest himself, who turns out to be Sidgear, the former Jarl of Falkreath. I attempt to reduce his magicka regen with a poisoned arrow, but he resists the effect. He strikes out at us with lightning until he seems to run out of magicka, then retreats back into the city while we continue to pelt him with arrows. It's a slow process, but with the healing potions we crafted, we're able to outheal the damage he's dealing. There are some close calls though. Complete alchemy and cooking overhaul changes how healing potions work so that they gradually restore HP over one second instead of doing it instantaneously, so we can't just pause the game and spam them like in the base game. But finally, after expending 40 ancient Nord arrows, Sidgear crumbles before us, and we've defeated the boss of Falkreath Hole. We're not done yet, though. There's still a swarm of Draugr occupying the city, so we charge in, hands aflame, and incinerate them one by one. Within the ruins of the Jarl's longhouse, we find it. The loot chest where Dragon Priest Sidgear had been hoarding the stolen treasures of Falkreath. 
This is our prize for clearing the first hold. This chest is loaded. There's enchanted armor and weapons, magic jewelry, and eight different spellbooks, which are there to account for this version of Skyrim not having the usual mages who we can buy spells from. We claim our treasure, then finish our cleanup of Falkreath. Now the ruined streets are littered with Draugr, many of whom were likely former residents of the town, but at least they might find peace now in Sovngarde. We return to our base at Cracked Tusk Keep, eager to take a well-deserved rest. This is only the start of our mission, however. We still have eight more holds to liberate from the dragon's tyranny, and Whiterun is next on the list. Now let's talk about magic. We actually got some really useful spells from that loot chest in Falkreath. One is Prepare for Adventure, an alteration spell from the Apocalypse spell mod that temporarily creates basic enchanted mage attire, robe, boots, and circlet in our inventory. This actually might make it viable for us to play a mage, because normally, Robes are really hard to come by in post-apocalyptic Skyrim. We also got the Bone Spirit spell, another spell from Apocalypse that deals a big burst of damage to undead. With these spells in mind, we put perk points into Alteration and Restoration, hoping to pivot our build a bit to focus more on magic. Under the cover of Nighttime Mists, we depart Falkreath for Whiterun and stumble across some roadside ruins. They appear to be home to a powerful Spriggan, so we decide to leave it be and carry on, arriving at the river in the early hours of morning. We swim across the water and take in the scenic view from the other side. The woods of Whiterun are bountiful with flora, but we soon discover they're also home to some of the most powerful undead we've dealt with so far. Across the water from Riverwood, we face down a restless Draugr and make use of our Bone Spirit spell to take him down in two bursts of radiant light, but the path ahead of us is far from safe. We're soon facing down a party of at least five more restless Draugr as we try to approach Whiterun. Apparently Falkreath was just the tutorial area. Now this mod is really not messing around. With spells and arrows, we do manage to return them to the grave, but now we know that caution is going to be our best friend as we continue deeper into Whiterun Hold. Whiterun is home to quite a few bandit camps, and one of them might make for our next base of operations. We cautiously try to skirt around the mountainside towards the eastern end of the city, but we hear a bone-chilling, menacing call in the distance. Sure enough, the monstrosity soon comes into view, a dragon patrolling the skies of Whiterun. Even from so far away, it seems to have spotted us. We might be strong enough to face down a dragon at this point, but the problem is that once a dragon has spotted you, it can alert the Draugr to your location, and they'll soon follow. We have a bit of distance on them, so we decide to flee, dodging bursts of the dragon's ice breath. This guy is not letting us get away, but we do spot a fortress in the distance where we might be able to shelter. It looks like there's a forge here, so perhaps this could serve as a base, but first we just want to get somewhere that's safe from the dragon's assault, so we charge inside. Fort Greymoor is now vacant, and we quickly find a cooking station, something we haven't had access to so far. This will let us make a much larger variety of recipes than we could at our campfires, including meals that will not only satiate hunger, but give us useful stat bonuses. We explore the fort and find a creepy prison with a flayed body and a dead troll. Then we venture out onto the fortress rooftop, but the dragon is still just outside, waiting for us to leave. Looks like we'll need to lie low for a bit. We rest for the night, taking a level up to seven. Fortunately, Fort Greymore has a secret escape tunnel out the back that we might be able to use to escape the patrolling dragon. We stealthily make our way out and down the creek. There's definitely still a dragon in the area, but it doesn't seem to be following us, so I think we got away. I'm hoping to find a crypt nearby where we can train up against some Draugr. So I head north towards the mountains, being sure not to get too close to the local giant who's out walking his mammoths. A bit later, I come to a quaint little cottage which I'm surprised to see isn't destroyed. Because I'm curious if the mod changed anything about it, and because I forgot what was here in the base game, I go traipsing on into Drellus Cottage. Yeah, bad idea. Drellus is another survivor, a dark elf mage, and he is not friendly. See that red diamond by the boss health bar? That means we're in trouble. I hightail it back out the door and run for it. Drellus follows and starts hurling fireballs at us, which deal enough damage to kill us in two hits. We sprint to get some cover behind these stone outcroppings and think we can find safety by clambering down this ledge. Okay, I think, I think at the bottom of this we'll have enough rocks. Wait, no, no, no! That wasn't even, I didn't even like jump! Are you kidding? 